Thank you. Thank you. Well, the first thing I want to say is I, I have mutually enjoyed the time together and the significance. I like to go places where I think it will make a significant deposit and make a difference. And I, and I really feel God's got great plans. Not only has he already done great things with your church, but there's even greater things to come. Amen. So that in, in, in the future, if you want to do something in a big auditorium, um, I don't know if it could be 18, but it could be 19, possibly 18. But if we do it, uh, it'd be three times the size of this. So I would like to have uh, at least three times the ministry team from my school size come up to help minister. Because a lot of what happens, happens when they pray and how uh, God uses them. And we have about a, a hundred people, that's including the interns, that's in our our global school. So uh, we'd like to bring even more of them to help us because I like it when people don't have to wait really, really long to be prayed for. Uh, for those of you who are not able to be here, I, I do want to say we have some books that's left. If we sell out all books, my son will get a double commission. And, and he's just, you know, but if he doesn't sell everything, he won't. So, you know, he's, he wants me to push that a little bit. Uh, on these message series, the little books... Uh, just to help give him an advantage. Uh, if you buy three, we'll give you another one free. Uh, and so that's available. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It deals with the power in you. Is, it gives you the hope that you can see the supernatural in your life. It's uh, based upon another interpretation of Colossians um, chapter 1. I think it was 29. Uh, Awed by his grace out of the bunkhouse deals with the whole thing of grace. And uh, the one message is about uh, the grace in my family and the grace that's changed from my parents' generation through my generation, now my, my children, adult children's generation, the radical, radical change of grace in our lives. Um, and then learning how to minister under the anointing, how to have a healing ministry in your church. And there's, I think there's about 10 of those, um, uh, 10 of these books, are other, to other topics. But I want to highlight, this is the one book I want to highlight the Healing Breakthrough, the first half of this book, gives teachings and practices that happens in church that actually hurts faith for healing. And what I think are unscriptural, like Paul's thorn in the flesh, Paul didn't get healed, that had nothing to do with physical illness. Uh, there's, only, there's three times it's referenced in the Bible, thorn in your side, thorn in your eye. That's why thorn in the flesh <laughs> covers both. And uh, another one. Every time... And Paul was an Old Testament scholar, being a, 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 a rabbi um, under Gamaliel, one of the premier students that he had. He would have known that every time thorn in the flesh is used in the Old Testament, the Bible, the New Testament, it never meant sickness, and it always meant human beings persecuting the people of God. So that's just one illustration of how we have some bad teachings and um, and then also bad practices. And the second half of the book gives an understanding of teachings and practices that actually enhance an expectant faith for healing. And if, if I could have had this when, when I was in my 30s, uh, I think it would have expedited my growth in healing uh, significantly. And I, I, when I started to write it, I said, now, what is it that I do? What is it I've learned in 47 years of ministry pertaining to healing? That can be, and I put it in a very simple way, and that is this book, The Healing Breakthrough. Um, Want to give them away? Now, Pastor Denise, do you, I've given you and Pastor Glenn one each, but I am just so impressed that you have an MDiv. I don't know that many women that have MDivs, and Pastor Glenn said that you did, you excelled above him. And so for that excelling, I'd like to... Sow this into you. You're welcome. All right. I'd like to give this to one of your other. Okay, let's do the front row right here. All right, who wants this one? Who wants this one? Who wants this one? There you go. All right. Now, I just need to ask, what time do we need to be into the invitation for ministry 
And we need how how when do you back to the question because I know you got to empty the parking lot. Jesus serves at 1131. <laughs> That's a parking jam. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I believe in a second definite work of grace. <laughs> and so we, uh, we're going to shoot for being in the invitation by quarter after. All right. Would you open your Bibles to the 27th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew? And I want to speak to you on the subject this morning of two questions. In the trial of Jesus, Pontius Pilate asked Jesus two questions. And they are significant questions. He asked Jesus, or he asked the people, I mean, of, of who are crowded around. And it, it, I was told, though we don't know for sure, that probably wasn't more than 100 people that would have been there for that early trial. Um, 300 max, but more likely 100. And he asked them this question, which one... Do you want me to release to you in the 17th verse? Which one do you want me to release to you? And in verse 21, he asked it a little bit different. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? So that question, which one, which of these two do you want me to release to you? Is a significant question. If I can answer the if I can answer the second question we want to talk about, it will enable everyone here who maybe has not answered that first question, which one do you want me to release to you? It will help you to make the right decision. See, a second question that he asked Jesus, or asked the people, I mean, um, why, when they said crucifying, what do you want me to do if Jesus crucifying? Why? What crime has he committed? I want us to focus on the question, why did Jesus have to die? I believe that Albert Schweitzer was wrong when he said he was an apocalyptic prophet and things got out of control and he ended up getting crucified. I think that is ridiculous. I don't think the scripture teaches that. I want to give you seven reasons Jesus had to die. And, and don't worry, I'm not going to preach on all seven of them. I'll be doing well to get through three. And, if, and, and we're doing excellent if we get to through number four. But I'm going to give you seven scriptural answers that you can look up and study the scriptures on. That is an answer to the question, why did Jesus have to die because we want to make sure that we understand it was not an accident things did not get out of control he set his face to go to Jerusalem at the time of the um, the Passover and the, the lambs that were being slain so um, let me give you the scriptures to these seven reasons Jesus had to die and come back and talk about three or four of them and then I'm going to ask you at the end of the message which one do you want me to release to you Bob Dylan wrote a song in one of his albums after he accepted Christ. He accepted Christ. One of my friends led him to Jesus out in California named Ken Gullickson. Uh, and Bob was in his church. And he wrote this song. He said, you got to serve somebody. Everybody has to serve and is serving somebody. And there's really only two masters. We're either following the Lord or we're following in deception the enemy, Satan. The one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Barabbas is very much a type of the... Well, you know, who would want to choose? Well, today, we would call him a terrorist. That's what Barabbas would be called today. And the choice is between Barabbas and Jesus. And why you would choose to release a terrorist to you rather than someone that all he did was encourage, heal, love, lift up, give respect, give honor to the poor... Flip the theology of the day of prosperity theology on its head, and which basically said, if you're prosperous, it's a sign you have favor of God. And basically, if you were poor, is a sign of the judgment of God. That was kind of the theology of the, of the day. And he flips it on its head and basically said, blessed are you who are poor, 
For to you belongs the kingdom of heaven. His, his message was different. His, his emphasis was different. His understanding of grace triumphing over sin was different. Whereas in the Old Testament, don't touch something unclean. Grace is greater than the sin. And he actually touches the leper. He touches the people um, who were dead. He touches the thing. He, he sees the love of God overcoming. And so we move from a, 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 an understanding of what sin is to an understanding of how much more powerful grace is than sin. And yet... The crowd chooses Barabbas over Jesus. The Apostle Paul said when that happens, it's because the God of this world has blinded us. When we hear the gospel and we do not choose Jesus, it's because at that point in our life, our eyes are still blinded to the gospel. Now, I want to pray that As I speak today, that any blinders that anybody has, whether you've never been born of the Spirit, because being religious won't get you to heaven. Being baptized won't get you to heaven. If you're not, if you've not been born of His Spirit, water baptism, you're going to go down a sinner and come up an unforgiven sinner. But if you're born of His Spirit, then that's what counts. Born of the water and of the Spirit. It's got to be a spiritual birth. Faith lays hold of the reality. The Holy Spirit is the witness and the full assurance that you're saved. John Wesley was willing to break with John Wesley Fletcher, who was the guy he was going to turn his Methodist movement over to, when he thought Wesley, uh, when when he thought Fletcher, I shouldn't have said John Wesley Fletcher, but when he thought, John, when he thought John Fletcher was teaching that you, it, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit to be saved. He said, no, we're saved by faith. We're justified by faith. And so we can't add anything to that. We're justified by faith. But Wesley did say the full assurance that we have been saved is that we have had that work of grace in our life that we are aware of. It's conscious and it is experiential. He he wasn't saying that's what saves us. Our faith is what saves us. But real faith, to give you full assurance, will produce that kind of an experience. Paul wrote to the Galatians, did you receive the Spirit through the works of the law or by faith? That question does not make sense if we reduce faith to an intellectual assent to a creedal statement. If, if it doesn't make sense unless there, you can say, I know I have received the Spirit because the basis of being a Christian was the reception of the Spirit. Gordon Fee in his book about this thick called God's Empowering Presence said, the, most important, the second most important doctrine in the teachings of the Apostle Paul in all of his writings is that you are justified by grace through faith. But the most important teaching of the Apostle Paul that's even more foundational than justification by grace through faith is that real faith lays hold of an experience with the Spirit. I'm not even talking about being baptized in the Spirit. I'm talking about being born again of the Holy Spirit, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, and you should be able to know. Now, having said that, I'm very quickly, I'm thinking of the pastor, one of the greatest churches in Harrisburg, who told me just last week, he said, I can't tell you the day I saved. I'm thinking of Bill Johnson, who's told me when I interviewed him, I can't, de- I can't tell you when I became a Christian. Because he, they both were raised in Christian homes Uh, strong Christian homes and from the time they were little they believed and they can't remember the moment they were born again as I can Uh, but that doesn't make their the reality of their being a Christian questionable because they are aware of the activity of the Holy Spirit in their life now they just don't remember when it started but the issue is there is a living presence And you are aware that God is in you. I grew up a Baptist. And when I was uh, 20 years old, I took over a dead church that had died. They had a funeral for it, closed the doors. 
and they wanted to resurrect it. And they had six people all over 60 in, in uh, uh, Sunday school and uh, 12 people in church when I went for my first Sunday. And it was a United Church of Christ. And it was a, um, they had never heard of the term, you must be born again. That was, they'd never heard that. And I thought, if you haven't heard it, then you aren't. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I said, you got to be born again, then you're not born. That was my 20-year-old naivety. But what I found out while I was pastoring that church was I met some beautiful saints of God who loved Jesus with their whole heart, who had a relationship with God, but they couldn't tell me when they were born again. And that term didn't make, they didn't know what it meant because it had never been, it had never been preached to them. And I learned that you can be born again and they have never heard of the term or concept of born again. You may have heard it in another way. Of, but you, I found out it's, that knowledge of the terminology is not what's important. It's the experience of the Spirit. And I met some beautiful Christians who, like Bill and Johnson and, and uh, Dave Hess and Harrisburg, the Christ Community Church, a big charismatic church, they can't tell you the day it happened, but they've been walking with Jesus almost their whole life. And they can tell you lots of experiences with the presence of Jesus. Apart from his presence being the witness, you have no biblical assurance that you really are a Christian. And I believe when revival comes, one of the things that happen is that people who have had false conversions have real conversions. The greatest revival in the Baptist denomination, which I was in for 14 years, and I grew up in, in the Baptist was called the Shantung Revival. And it was called also the Born Again Revival. And it started with the leaders, missionaries in China, in Shantung province. And it was based upon two questions they began to ask each other. And they're missionaries. Some of them had been to seminary. Most of them had been to seminary, actually. And they asked them these two questions. Have you really been born again of the Spirit of God? And the second question, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Now, hopefully, if there's a person here that you realize may God will be drawing you, talking to you, speaking to you, I need to give my life to him. Or maybe you gave your life to him years ago, but you've backslidden and haven't really been walking with God for maybe months or years. And you need to renew. You need to be like the prodigal son. You need to come home. Or there may be some people here that you've been in church every Sunday, but you're a hypocrite. You say, how can you be in church every Sunday and be a hypocrite? I, I, I can tell you how. I was one. I backslid at, 11, at um, 18 years old. I got saved at 16, Sunday for my 16th birthday. Backslid at 18. I was in church twice on Sunday and on every Wednesday night. But I was a hypocrite. I was running in two crowds. With the druggies. Because of 1907, the Vietnam War. My friends were coming home in body bags and without their legs. And, and it was a very hard time to be an 18-year-old young guy and, and uh, a senior in high school. And I, I just got in at the wrong crowd. And I let the bitterness and the, and the anger that I was feeling uh, affect me. And, and I, I, I got into the drug culture. And so I was in church every Sunday, like I said, twice. And I looked good. I was the leader of the youth group. Every Wednesday night. Why would you do that? Because I was afraid that if I got so far away from God, I couldn't find my way home. I actually knew when I started to walk away uh, in this hypocrisy, I, I knew I was a prodigal son. And I actually knew I was not happy. As a matter of fact, I remember one time I was in the car and, and we were smoking some um, um, grass that was Acapulco Gold and it was very hallucinogenic. It was laced with some type of a chemical and... And um, um, anyway, 
And, and, we're, and so the, the, the glory in the, I had a new Chevelle Supersport, you know, the muscle car, 396, four-speed, 350 horse. You know, every, every guy's dream at that time. I was working in the oil fields with my dad. And, um, and so there's, a, there's a, an incense-like smell, but it wasn't the Shekinah glory in the car. <laughs> and uh, um, and they're, they're, they're talking about, what are you going to do when, when we get, you know, we get out of high school? And uh, one of my friends said, I'm going to Canada. I'm not going to Vietnam. I'm going to Canada. And I'm going to have all the drugs I want. And the other one says, I'm going to Canada. I'm going to have all the women I want. And uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it PG-13. And, um, um, and everybody was, you know, there's three of us, four of us in the car talking about what we were going to do. And, uh, and I heard myself say, I'm going to be a preacher. I had never thought I'd be a preacher. I had no, I, 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 I thought, oh, where'd that come from? Get, get those words back in my mouth. I was, I, I, I was like, oh my gosh, where did that, I, really, I had never thought of that. I had never thought it myself. But anyway, the words came out. God has a way of putting, uh, God has a way of fencing you in. Uh, shortly after that, I was at, um, uh, at, this is the days when they used to come out to your car and put the tray on your window. And all the, in the small towns where I'm from, there's nothing to do. I mean, we didn't have a skating rink. We didn't have a drive-in. We didn't have a theater. We didn't have, where there, I mean, we didn't have anything. All there was to do is drive around. And you drive around the square and come back down and go around the I mean, park there and everybody in there, whoa, 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 with their cammed up cars. And, and, uh, and so I got Steppenwolf on. And there's this uh, song called The Pusher Man. And it's, it, it says, GD, The Pusher Man. And I got as loud as it'll go. And I'm backslidden. I'm a hypocrite. And I'm in church. So I, I know you can backslide while you're in church. But my thing is, why would you do it? Because I did not want to stay. I didn't want to get so, I'm an Arminian. I'm not a Calvinist. I, I believe you can resist the grace of God. And I do believe you can commit apostasy. And I, I, I believe you can lose your salvation uh, because that's the kind of Baptist we were, like free will Baptists. And I was afraid that I would get so deep in sin that I, wouldn't, I would never come back to God. I didn't believe in the perseverance of the saints. It was, you know, it was once saved, always saved. And that was my fear. I would get so deep in sin, I would not find my way back. I wanted to be, the, I wanted to be like, I always knew I wanted to come back home because I knew I was actually, let me put it this way. I was a double hypocrite. I was not only a hypocrite in church, I was a hypocrite with my friends. I was wearing a mask in both worlds because I knew I was actually happier when I was in a right relationship with God. And I was backslidden for, I, I was like that for 11 months. So you may be here and you may be where I was at. It's just a miserable place to be. You can't be fun in the world because you feel guilty and you can't be you can't really be at peace and, and have joy in the church because you feel guilty. And you, you realize you're a hypocrite in both places. No one, I've, I've never seen anybody say, I'm not going to go to that bar anymore because there's some Christians down there that they're just, there's some drinkers down there that are just hypocrites. They're pretending they're having fun when they're not. I'm, <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't talk like that, do we? We just about the church. Why did Jesus have to die? I got off the subject there, but maybe that Lord wanted me to share it a little bit. Jesus had to die. It was so important that we understood why Jesus had to die, that God made sure that the people of Israel, would, the Jewish people, would understand, and he would make the major feast types of understanding who Jesus was. And the very first one is the deliverance. And I'm going to list these seven for you and then come back and do three at least. Deliverance. Jesus had to die so that people could be set free. And the typology of that was the children of Israel in captivity, in bondage to the Egyptians. 
and how God would deliver them out of Egypt. And that Jesus would be the Passover lamb that would be slain, that would bring about freedom uh, from our sin, the taskmaster of sin, uh, the taskmaster of demons, the taskmaster of setting us free, uh, the bondages that we can be in. Um, Jesus had, and that's Exodus chapter 12, Jesus had to die so that we could uh, be forgiven of our sin, not just delivered from the captivity and bondage and power of, 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 of addictions and demonic power and just evil, but also be forgiven and have a clean conscience. And that's talked about, uh, and God wanted us to know it so we'd understand the typology in Leviticus chapter 16 where they bring forward on the Day of Atonement the two goats and they, the high priest who both Jesus and the Hebrews has seen as both the scapegoat and the first goat and the high priest, he makes intercession. He's, he becomes all of that. It's all pointing to Jesus. But when he puts his hands on the first goat, the sins of all the people are put on that goat. And then he cuts the throat of the goat, takes the blood of the goat, puts it on his vestments. Now only, if that's why he's got a rope tied around his foot. If he goes into the Holy of Holies to meet God in his way rather than God's way, the, the glory and the mercy that's there done God's way will become judgment and the person will die. And nobody else can go in there but the high priest. So that's why they got the rope and the bells on so they can tell if he's still alive or not. And this is justification, just as if you've never sinned. So through the blood of Jesus, you have access to the mercy seat. This is poured, pointing to Jesus shedding his blood for us. And so Jesus had to die so we could be justified. Jesus had to die so that we could be forgiven. But for a lot of us, that's where we stop. But they doesn't stop there in the story in Leviticus 16 on the Day of Atonement because after he's made intercession for people, he comes back out. The high priest comes back out and he places his hands on the second goat. And then they lead the goat outside the camp bearing away the sins of the people, which is to be a sign, justification, sanctification. There's too little emphasis today on sanctification, I believe. Uh, I know that uh, Pentecost, uh, Assemblies of God, uh, much like Baptists, believe that sanctification is a process. You start out, well, I'm, 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 as you look at my life, it's kind of like this. I have ups and downs, but over time, my, high, my lows are even higher than my, than my highs were. I'm, I'm becoming more Christ-like. Over time, God is in the process of sanctifying me. But the earliest Pentecostals before Assemblies of God came out of the holiness movement, which taught that there is a second definite work of grace where you, by this experience, you gain power over sins you'd not been able to, to have victory over. And they would even say you could be perfected. Now, I, I'm, I'm not going to that, the that level, but I do believe that there's truth in both of these camps. That's why when, when I was pastor, I had my associate pastor teach a sermon on he, sanctification as a process. And I came back and taught the next week on sanctification as an event and said, it's not an either or. It's actually a both and. Because you can have an experience where you've not been able to break free of certain compulsive, addictive Things that you're embarrassed about as being a Christian. You know that doesn't look good on you. But you've never been able to have victory. And we can seek God and seek the power of the Holy Spirit. And have an experience that can give us victory over those things. But it doesn't mean, in my opinion, that we are perfected and cannot sin again. But we are given power to be much more victorious than what we have been. And so I believe that today, it may be that's what you stand in need of. Jesus died so that you could not only be justified, but you could be in the process of sanctification. And basically, he, we are called saints from the moment uh, imputed righteousness. But it's not just imputed righteousness that's enough. What I mean by imputed righteousness, he sees us as if we're Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. That's imputed righteousness. But imputed righteousness says, I see you in a right relationship. But if there's not enough power to literally break off of us and give us freedom to live free from the thing, because sin hurts us. It's not that God's a party pooper. 
It's not he got this list. You don't do these things. It's he said, these things will hurt you, hurt your marriage, hurt society. And these things are counterproductive. And these things are not good or healthy for you. I made you. I have the owner's manual. And you want to stay away from these things. And so there is not only a grace that gives us imputed righteousness so that we can come boldly to the throne of God in our time of need. But there's also an, an enthused righteousness, which is by the power of the Holy Spirit, as the angel said to Mary, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall deliver his people or save his people from their sin. Imputed righteousness is a saved us in our sin. Infused righteousness, there's a grace as a power that gives us the ability to break free from the sinful lifestyles and helps us to walk, and, 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 like the second goat, bearing away the sins of the people. So, number three, Jesus had to die that we could be healed. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 5, uh, in his death at the cross, in his scourging before the cross, there, and, and, and even at the cross, he's bearing his body, our sickness and our disease, as he did our sins and our iniquities. Number four, he had to die so that we could be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And actually, that's one of the biggest things in the, in, the, in the whole understanding of the new covenant. Because the people of God in the Old Testament could be forgiven of their sin. But they, it was not a time when every person who was part of God, the, the covenant of the old covenant, only the prophets and the kings had the experience of the Spirit coming upon them. But in the new covenant, it is, there's going to be this change. And it's not just about forgiveness, but it's going to be a working it in our hearts. And it's, it's going to be by the Holy Spirit. And every Christian has the ability to receive a filling or being baptized with the Holy Spirit, even as every Christian now is born again. And there's a regeneration uh, that's going on. But God uh, and, and I'll show you the passage. John chapter 7, verse 37. Um, it, Jesus is talking about, um, and I believe it's in, in Tabernacles, I believe. I can't think right now. But anyway, it's about the water. And there's one time the water is being poured out. And he said uh, uh, that he was like the living water. And John said, it's not Jesus, but John said this. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, we need to understand our gospel is just not a gospel of the cross. Thank God for the cross. And we preach the cross. But the cross without the resurrection would not be the gospel. And the cross and a resurrection without an ascension would not be the gospel. Our fullness of the gospel is just there is a cross. And when we preach the cross, it's like this is the entry into a newness of life by being born again, what he did at the cross. But he also uh, was raised from the dead and he ascended so that now once he is ascended, he can pour out the Holy Spirit and we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and given a grace to live victoriously because we're no longer living by our will trying to be good. But we have a supernatural grace. He's changed our hearts, changed our attitude. It's not something on the outside of us. It's not something we know we ought to do. But it's something there's an internal witness of the Holy Spirit. Grace is not only putting me, giving me undeserved forgiveness. Grace is not just undeserved forgiveness. Grace is also divine empowerment. That's why the gifts of the Holy Spirit are called gracelets. They're manifestations of God's grace. They make God real to us. And for everyone, every child of God in this dispensation, because Jesus went to the cross, that's one of the reasons he had to die. That we could be delivered, that we could be forgiven, that we could be healed, that we could be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus had to die that we could have eternal life. John chapter 3, 14 through 16. You know John 3, 16. Jesus had to die, number uh, 6, so that God's plan could be fulfilled that was before the foundation of the world. And you see it in Peter's sermon on Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 24. And number 7, Jesus had to die so that God's justice and holiness could be presented as well as his love. 
the justice and holiness of God. Read Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. I don't have time to go to those others. I want to come back now and give um, a few illustrations. My, my, my maternal grandpa was a womanizer, an alcoholic, violent temper when he got drunk tear up the furniture. My mom would hide behind the door crying, scared as he and his brother were both alcoholics. And I'm just so grateful, so thankful. I have no memories like that. My mom has these terrible memories of his alcoholism. And he got my grandmother pregnant who was not a saved woman. She wasn't Christian. She was playing a guitar and a honky-tonk. And my grandmother was illiterate. And, uh, in fact, I'm the first person in my family to go past the eighth grade. And, uh, uh, but my grandpa got my grandma pregnant, the drunkard. Got her pregnant while he's still married to another woman. He didn't get his divorce, and my grandpa and grandma didn't get married until two months before my mother was born. But I never knew that man. I am so grateful that he died before I knew him. I'm so glad he died. I don't have any memories like that. I'm so glad. The grandpa I knew loved Jesus. I'd sit by him in the amen corner of a little country Baptist church. I'd see him get on his knees and just cry as he's crying out to God. He was a gentle man. The grandpa I knew, not the one that died, but the one I knew. Never touched another drop of alcohol. He didn't drink. He didn't. His hand never slapped my grandmother around. He was never unfaithful. He was a faithful man, a gentle man. I'm so glad that evil man died. I'm glad he died. And I'm glad the night he died, my dad died. They died side by side on the same night in that little General Baptist church when the altar call was given. They came to the altar and both of them died and were born again and became new men. And he was a, and it's the same man, but it's a born again man. The old man died and he was given, I mean, he was given power to live free of his alcoholism. He never, he, and I believe in the 10 points. I'm, I'm wonderful if he really follow it, but, it not, but your higher power can't be that doorknob. Your higher power can't be a tree. Your higher power can't be anything you want it to be. When it really started, the higher power was Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the steps you went through was actually stuff you needed to do to get right with God and make things right with people. It was really biblical and scriptural. And they've watered it down now. But my grandpa didn't have to go one time to an, to an AA meeting or an NA meeting because his one step model right there at that altar when he was born again, he got totally set free by the grace of God and never, never did any of that stuff again. And I thank God for that. And the same night, it really was, my dad got saved right beside him. I was two years old when that happened. Thank God that Jesus still delivers men and women from the power of sin. A lot of people, I want to say this, two I've got to think how to say it politically correct. All right. <laughs> Two teachings that I think is watered down, holiness in the church. Number one, that Paul's experience in Romans 7 was his experience after he was converted. Again, Gordon Fee, a New Testament scholar, Assemblies of God scholar, has written one of the greatest books in my book, Power, Holiness, and Evangelism, which is not out there. I, bar I got permission to use his chapter of another book on, chap on Romans 7, and he teaches this is not Paul's experience having been saved, even though it's using past tense verbs, because this was a way of heightening an argument in that day that was common. People would speak in the past tense to heighten the experience as they were telling, and that was his experience before. For Christ, that was his experience under the law. And as Gordon Fee says, because if that's not the case, then everything else 
the Apostle Paul wrote about life in Christ is contradicted by, his, by that interpretation of Romans 7. So when I remember as a, a, a young Baptist boy growing up and hearing men come to the pastor and come into my dad was a deacon, they'd come and say, I'm struggling with sin. And the common answer that was given in the Baptist church, don't worry about it. The Apostle Paul could not get victory. Remember, he said, the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I, I want to do, I'm not doing. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Well, they didn't go on and say, thanks be to God who gives us the victory of Jesus Christ our Lord. They didn't get on over into in, in, in the chapter 8, that chapter of victory. And also was spoken of in chapter 6. If you're stuck in chapter 7, then you say, this is just going to be our, all, our experience. And even Paul could not get victory. It lowers the bar so low that we teach our people, you are to expect to be a defeated Christian. What Paul says, we, we are not to be mastered by the enemy, but, but by the Spirit. We're to be masters over sin and where is victory and so this teaching I think is got to be addressed and we got to uh, come and say to our people we can have much more victory than what we sometimes are experiencing and not water it down say even Paul couldn't get it we say no Paul had victory thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord the second thing is believing that Christians cannot be troubled by an evil spirit Because I know I was troubled. I thought I was normal. I thought all men were troubled in the way I was troubled. And because of this troubling, I had all these defenses to protect myself from falling. And then one night in front of 700 people, I went through deliverance from that troubling spirit. And afterwards, I used to say, I'm not even tempted anymore. And then the Holy Spirit said, oh, yeah, you are. But now you have the normal temptation of the flesh. What you had before was the temptation that was caused by a troubling spirit that was assigned to you. Pablo Butari and two of the top leaders of the Baptist, oldest Baptist church and second largest Baptist church with PhDs. And one was over the pastoral care department. They do clinics. They don't even call them seminars. They call them pastoral clinics because they found out in Chile and in Argentina, and I don't remember which is which, it's either 80% of the pastor's wives had been sexually abused and 70% of the pastors themselves had been sexually abused as kids of the Baptist denomination in both countries or vice versa, 80% of the women, 70% of the men. And they said, no wonder we're having such an issue of moral problems and brokenness because our leaders have this brokenness in them that needs to be healed. And it wasn't like condemnation. Let's get this healed up. Let's deal with these things that you're dealing with. There's a need for the church to be cleaned up. Revival is when there's a hope. Not just, you know, if I, if I, I don't want you to hear this in, in condemnation. Conviction, yes. Condemnation, no. Hope, yes. There is power in Jesus crying out for the Spirit. I believe, not only that, but I believe that when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's not just a baptism of power. It's a baptism of love. And it can be also a time of breaking free of practices and habits that we know don't look good on us. And sometimes these things that we are aware about is the reason why we don't talk about Jesus to our friends. Because we feel too compromised. When we can move into that place of greater victory, we're freed up to speak more boldly about what Jesus has done for us. Forgiveness. Oh, Jesus. Ah, I love him being the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Of him being both the source of my justification and my sanctification and forgiveness. I, I remember as a young Baptist preacher while I was in seminary in, Indi- in, in Kentucky. I was driving up to Indiana. I had a church in Indiana. And um, uh, 
I was preaching one day and I said, my, I heard my dad give a testimony one time. He said this. He said, I want to live my life so that my three kids can walk in my footsteps. I want to live my life that I would want my children to be able to walk in my footsteps. And I, I never forgot when dad said that. A little country Baptist church. You no, know, maximum 50 people fill it up. Uh, we, we ran about half full most of the time. Um, but I never forgot that. And so that day, I, I mentioned that in my sermon. When I did, this big woman, about 6'2", about 250 pounds, jumped up. And she just hit the door so hard that when she hit the door, it slammed all the way back and hit the brick wall. And bam! And I thought, did her dad just die? What's, what's going on there? I'd never seen her before. I asked some of the people. And I said, oh, Randy, be careful. Be careful of her. She's the meanest person in this county. If she gets mad at you, she'll slit your tires. And I thought, I need to go see her. So my wife is 5'2", and she, still, she, you know, she got down to 93, but she usually weighs around 97 pounds. And uh, she had some sickness here lately and lost 6 pounds, and she's trying to gain it back. She eats two ice cream cones a day just so she can not lose weight. And um, anyway, I can look at food and gain weight, but, you know, she's blessed. Uh, but, but she's, you know, 5'2", and, you know, 90-some pounds. And I took her with me for protection. And... Uh, uh, <laughs> And we went to see Sue. And when we got to the mobile home in which she lived, uh, I was asking her what was going on. And, and she said, um, when you said that, she said, wait a minute. I'll be right back. She went and got her scrapbook. Her scrapbook was cuttings out of the local paper. And I'm flipping through it. Drunk and disorderly. Battery. Contributing to delinquency of minors. Drunkenness, disorder, fighting, prison, prison. I mean, not prison, but jail, 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 jail. It, it's, a, it's a scrapbook that she was proud of because men were afraid of her. She would whip men. And then she said this, I used to be proud of this. But I'm pregnant. Well, she wasn't married. I'm pregnant. I have a little girl in me. I don't want my daughter walking in my footsteps. I need to change. And then she said, I'm, I'm facing prison. Because I, my, we went to a party. I don't know why a woman would go to a bachelor's party, but she did. Her brother was there. And uh, she shows up at this bachelor's party. It's a sailor's getting ready, going to be shipped off. And, and they, 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 got, they all got drunk and they, they got in a fight. And they were about to beat her brother. She thought they were going to beat her brother, Harry, to death. So she carried a butcher knife underneath her seat. Now, I suspect the character of people who carry butcher knives under the front seat of their car. She grabbed it and went into the fight and stabbed the groom. And he almost died. So she's facing possible long, long years in prison. She says, I want to change. But it can't be just changed so I don't have to go to prison. I need to really change. I, I, I need a real experience with God. And I spent time praying with her, talking with her, explaining the gospel. Got the simple uh, uh, cross and switchblade, real easy Bible to read, New Testament to read in the language of the people. Because she wasn't very well educated. And, you know, she's an alcoholic. Her mom and dad were both alcoholics. There's eight kids or nine kids in the family. Every one of them is an alcoholic. I wrote a letter because she started coming to church regularly. I wrote a letter to the judge explaining how what I'm seeing in her and how she's wanting to reform her life. So on the day she was sitting, the, pat, the judge says, is, is Reverend Clark here? And I, I was very young, you know, I was uh, like 22 at the time. I stood up and he said, based on your letter, I would let her go. I, I would let her go under your oversight. But then he pulled up her rap sheet. <laughs> but there'd be no justice if I don't sentence her to something. But then he said this, but instead of 60 years, I'm going to sentence her to 60 days in the women's penitentiary of Indian, in Indianapolis. And then when she gets out, I'm going to have her be under you. And week after week after week, my wife and I would go on every, we'd drive up to Indianapolis another 40 minutes from where the church was at. And I'd go in and talk to her. And I'd, but she never would pray the prayer of repentance and give her life to God and then one day I walked in about two weeks before her sentence was over and I, when she walked 
into the place where I was at. I looked at her countenance and I knew she just, she'd been saved. I could see it on her countenance. You, I, I, she, I said, tell me what happened. She said, I, I got saved. I said, I, I, I knew it. I knew it. How did that happen? She says, well, you know that book you gave me? It's got this prayer in the back. And I know you've been trying to get me to pray it. But I, I wanted it to be real. And I, I, and I did. And I said, well, how, how do you know it's real? She said, I felt so much love. I felt so much joy. I, I, I know I'm chained. She said, I'm praying for the man I stabbed. I'm praying for his family. I'm praying for my brothers. I'm praying for my whole family. I know what I've done is wrong, but I don't feel guilty about it anymore. I know I'm forgiven. I, I want you to baptize me. And I said, sure, I'll baptize you. And, oh, the first Sunday out of prison, the little church I pastored had a little, bab- little river, little Baptist river, little river that's g- g- advantageous for Baptists, little river, but it was cold. And I'm thinking, man, that's a little cold to be in there. Why don't we wait and do it in a baptistry that's heated? And he said, no, I want to do it in the river. So we walked down into the river and Sue, you know, she's actually bigger than me. Uh, but, but Sue came in there with me and up on the bank is mom and dad. And up on the bank is eight or nine, eight brothers and sisters. Every one of that family is an alcoholic. And they all got their own histories and it's not good. And they watched me baptize Sue within six months Sue is a Sunday school teacher because those who have been forgiven of much loves much and she had a real experience with God she was set free and delivered from her alcoholism she is set free and delivered from the demons that was tormenting her and not only that but there was such a transformation in her life that she became a missionary to the Scudder family and then her brother Harry gets saved and then another older brother gets saved and before I leave that church two of her brothers are deacons in the Baptist church and she's a Sunday school teacher and for the next 18 years I get a picture every Christmas of her little girl that now has turned into an 18 year old young woman and for about 18 years I got a picture of her daughter and a Thank you that through the grace of God, her life was turned around. I'm telling you, if God has the power to set a man like my grandpa free, a womanizing, alcoholic, wife-beating person, unfaithful, God's the power to set this alcoholic Sue free and turn her around. He has the power to set you free. Jesus had to die that you could be forgiven. He had to die that you could be saved not only justified but sanctified he had to die that you could be baptized in the Holy Spirit he had to die that you could be healed my grandmother I got interested in healing because my grandmother this illiterate she um, told me when I was five years old she uh, she's sweeping the floor in the bedroom two-bedroom block house she's sweeping floor she said honey come here right here is when your grandmother heard the audible voice of Jesus I said tell me about grandma tell me grandma well, I was vacuuming. I had a great big goiter, and they didn't know how to treat goiters. And it was on, the, on my in my neck, and I heard a voice, just like you're hearing my voice. It wasn't a thought; it was a voice, and said, "Mary Magdalene, that's her that's her name, Mary Magdalene. You go into the other bedroom, which is just three steps away." And you say, "Well, why do you have to go in the other bedroom?" My, if you're simple, like <laughs> I didn't know Grandma was illiterate for a long time. I knew she listened to sermons on the radio. That's the only way because she couldn't read the Bible. Walk into the other bedroom. You're simple. You don't, you don't say why. You say, okay. She said, all right. She put me by the hand, pulled me into the other bed. She said, right here, standing right here by the corner of this bed. I did what he said. I went in there, and I began to pray, and it felt like a hot hand went down my throat, and instantly that growth disappeared. That's what gave me an interest in healing. That's what gave me an interest. I want to sit on my great grandmother's lap and watch Oral Roberts <laughs> as a little boy, three and four years old, in the healing line. Most three and four year olds aren't interested in watching the healing line of Oral Roberts, but I was because my grandmother had heard the voice of God and it resulted in an instant healing. And when they told me I wasn't supposed to lift my head off of a pillow because I was almost killed in a car accident, when my best friend, second best friend, Joe, from whom I over, for whom I named my daughter, Johanna. My second best friend, Joe, he was a Catholic. And he was not a good Catholic. I wasn't a good Baptist. He wasn't a good Catholic. And he and Joe and, and, and George, my best friend, we, they called us the three musketeers because we were always together during that last year of high school and starting in the first year of college. And on the, I had been rededicated. 
I, I met with a worship leader and a youth pastor, and I said, here are my drugs. Flush them down the toilet. I broke up with the girlfriend with whom I was having um, um, sinning. Keep it, <laughs> keep it PG. Um, who had won a beauty contest. And, and, you know, there was just things that the, 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 the weren't good. And I'm trying to get these things out of my life. And I gave it to him. And I gave my life to the Lord. And I, can't, I be honest with you, it was not the powerful experience of being born again when I was 16. But it was coming home to God. And it was saying, I was sorry. And it was change. And Joe told me, on, I did that on Sunday night. On Monday night, I'm out with Joe. And Joe said, you know, Randy, I, I admire you. Because what you've done, I plan to do. I, don't, I know what I'm doing is wrong. Now, Joe was his parents, or his dad was an alcoholic. Um, and, and, and he was going to mass, but he was also drunk every night and stoned every day. And he said, I'm going to do what you have done. I respect you as a Baptist that you've given your life to God and, and you've quit the drugs and stuff. And I'm going to do it too, but I, I got some wild oats I want to sell first but when I'm an older person when I get 30 <laughs> I'm going to become a good Catholic and I'm going to quit this stuff and I too want to follow Jesus two days that was Monday on Thursday we're driving home from college my cousin who hates Christians because his dad was involved in a an unhealthy church expression that didn't believe in doctors. And, and uh, his brother had needed knee surgery. His brother snuck him off to get knee surgery. And his father was so angry that he tried to tear the stitches out of his brother's leg. And then his other brother got in a fist fight with his father. And then his father and mother got divorced. And his father had never seen him in about 10 years. And within one day didn't even recognize him on the street. There is unhealthy religion too. And it was that unhealthy form of Christianity that caused my cousin to hate Christians. And so he's mad at me because I gave the drugs away. I was the only one who had a job. I was, you know, I'm, I'm the source of their drugs because they had no money. I, they were my best friends. And I've quit it. They're, they're, they're cut off. And he's mad. He said, Clark, we're driving home from college. He said, Clark, you know, if we had a wreck right now, you'd die and go to hell. And Joe on the bucket seat right beside me, who two days before had said, I'm going to do what you've done. I respect you. He looked at me and said, that's right, Clark, you would. And I looked at Joe and said, no, I wouldn't. But what about you? That's a heavy discussion for 18-year-olds. Those were the last words I spoke to my second best friend because in less than five minutes, another friend and a 69 road runner was, trying, was passing me. Now, we weren't racing, but he's passing me and he came around the curve so fast, he's all half the car's on the road highway and half of it's off. He hit a little rut and it threw his car into my car, knocked me, my car, off the road. And I went from here to that wall and hit a concrete embutment. And Joe was thrown through the windshield and his neck was broke and he died instantly. And I was almost killed. And I was paralyzed. And my intestines didn't work. And my jaw had to be set. And I had. Uh, I later found out every vertebra in my disc was fractured. Every vertebra in my back was fractured. I had pinched nerves. I was on 50 milligram of Demerol every three hours and begging for a shot before. I, I was in so much pain. And through the prayers of a little Baptist church, my jaw set itself. When I was going to have to be operated on because of the, the paralysis. And they told me, do not move. If you got to move, punch this. We'll get three nurses to log roll you because you're after, your, your spine can swell and you're not paraplegic, but you could become paraplegic. So don't move. It's important that you don't move. And so first thing, I was supposed to be in the hospital, 49, 77 days. So I see. I see. First of all, they come in and set my jaw. Do it again. Do it again. He said, I don't understand it. I came here to set your jaw. I've got the picture. Your ex your jaw's broken. It's already set. And then that, the night that prayed for me, that my youth group prayed for me, the next day, my paralysis is gone. 
they pulled the tubes out. I, had, I was being fed in, in the arm and, and, and sucked out, you know, through here. And tubes, about anywhere you can put a tube. It, it, was, it was a terrible situation. Then I heard, I saw it. Then I heard one morning after all this pain, it's gone. I do not have the pain. And I don't have to have the 50 milligram of Dem uh, Demerol that I've been taking for days. And by the 15th day, when I was supposed to be in from 49 minimum to 77 days in the hospital, I'm laying there with no pain. I'm thinking about it. God's healed me. I'm putting two and two together. I didn't get it with the jaw, but I got it with the, the, with the paralysis. And then when the pain left, and then I'm laying in bed, and I don't hear an audible voice, but I hear an impression. I've healed you. Get up and walk. I said, I'm not supposed to get my head. I didn't even have a pillow. I had reflective glasses reading like this. And I'd started reading the New Testament fell in love with Jesus. I'd, you know, I'm a performance-oriented kid. I wanted to have a lot of chapters turned in. So 117, 123, through around 131 is all the shortest psalms in, in the Bible. If you want to turn in some chapters, that's where you can get a lot of them and a little bit of reading. But I'd never read the New Testament. And I'm reading in the hospital, falling in love with Jesus. I told him, you saved my life. I give it back to you. I'll do anything you want me to do, but please don't call me to preach. Because I was afraid I'd fall. I was afraid I'd fall. Anyway, I don't have time to tell you about that uh, call to, to the ministry. But I believed it was the Lord so much I risked a great risk. I put the side of the bed down and I got up and I began to walk. And they saw me. Get back in bed. You're going to be paralyzed. You can't. And they, they had to actually sent the head sister in talk, it was Catholic hospital to talk to me. I said, don't you believe in Jesus? And she said, yes, of course I do. I said, so do I. And he's healed me. He's not going to let me be paralyzed. And I went home. I kept saying, I'm going to go home in time for this revival. It was four weeks away, and I got out on the 20th day, but I was healed on the 15th day, but they're waiting for a brace for me to wear. And revival broke out in the Jesus movement the, the Sunday after I got home. And the first day home, they said, go home and go to bed. I said, I'm not going to bed. You didn't get me out of here. Jesus got me out of here. I'm going to church tonight. I'm going to tell the young people. And this revival broke out. And one, I, want to, I want to end with this. And then I'm going to ask you the question. Which one do you want me to release to you? It's not Barabbas and Jesus. It's Jesus and the father of the lies. The one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if anything I've said you identify with, you get a chance to make a decision. Bob Dylan said, you got to serve somebody. He said, I'm just serving myself. No, that's deception. Blinders come off. So the last story. I'm, where all those kids hang out, here's Mike. Mike's the biggest pusher in our county. Everybody knows Mike's really messed up on drugs and he got out of Vietnam early because of of uh, problems he had from Agent Orange and stuff. And, and, uh, but Mike's the biggest pusher in our county, and everybody knows it. And he used to, uh, I was a friend of his, and I went over to his car. He's got a 69 Chevelle Super Sport. I went over there and knocked on his window. He rolls his window down. I said, Mike, I got something better than you've ever had. It's the best thing. It's better than any drug you've ever had. I said, what, 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 what's that? I said, it's Jesus. And that so touched Mike because Mike was so messed up. He'd been in a mental institution because he was so drugs that affected him so much that he literally had 16 tabs of LSD in his pocket. He's got a Harley, and he's, going, he's determined, I'm going to take these 16 tabs of LSD and start down the highway on that Harley, and I'm going to end my life at 23 years old. But instead, in the middle of the Jesus movement, his girlfriend got him to come to the little Baptist church, and that night I saw Mike get up, come to the front, and he's crying out. I remember hearing his prayer. God, I'm a messed up man. I've messed up my life. My mind is messed up. My body's messed up. I, I'm, 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 I'm captive to sin. I, I don't know how to pray. I've never prayed. I don't know what to say except I give you my life as broken as it is. If there's anything you can do for me, please come and help me. And he got gloriously saved and he stood up and the, for the first person I ever saw fall in my life under the power of God was Mike got up, <laughs> did lift his hands like that and fell backwards and I caught him and I realized God can touch anybody and set anybody free. And he never had to deal with withdrawals, much as William never had to deal with withdrawals. Neither did Mike. You're here today. 
Which one do you want me to release to you? Now that you know why he had to die, it shouldn't be a hard decision. And the only reason anybody would choose not to come into the lordship and salvation in Jesus Christ would only be because the God of this world has blinded you. And so I want to pray for you. I want you to stand. Father, and I want the minister team to come forward. When the Moravians went out to share the gospel, they would say to each other, they would shout antiphonally to each other to win for the lamb that was slain the rewards of his suffering. And they only thought of it in the sense of salvation. But now you know the suffering, the rewards of his suffering is forgiveness, but it's also sanctification. It's also you can be baptized in the Spirit. It's also that you can be healed and you can be set free. If you're here today and you need Jesus in any one of these ways, the ministry team and the ministry team of the church, I'd like the ministry team of the church to come forward as well. And I'd like to start, if you're here and you're backslidden, if you're here and you're overwhelmed with sin, if you're here and you may say, well, I I'm living a compromised, hypocritical life, and I want what you just talked about. I want to have an experience in God so powerful that it breaks me free whatever it is your need is ask you to come now I've done this all over the world here's my invitation we're not going to sing just as I am all five verses and then switch over softly and tenderly Jesus calling calling for you and for me see on the portals he's waiting and watching watching for you and me I'm not going to do it I'm going to count from ten to zero and then the invitation's over so if you need Jesus in any of these ways you should come now don't wait till I get to 10. Just start now from the back, from the middle. Just start, come up, whatever it is that you need. And you may need someone to pray with you. That's fine. But he say, hey, I don't need any help. I know what I need to do. Then you can just come and kneel here to cry out to God. 10. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Let us have revival. Let's get, let's get real with God. Let's get free. 9. If you're coming to give your life to Jesus for the first time you really feel like I've never truly been saved and you want to be born again I'm gonna ask that you to come just stand right here in front of me if this thing I, I, I really realize I've never truly been born of God's Spirit just just come here eight seven six you may have a knot in your throat and tears in your eyes. You may feel like, I, I'm having an anxiety attack. He, he's preaching just to me. No, the Holy Spirit's making this message for you especially. Seven. Six. Three big lies of the enemy. Number one, you're so good you don't need Jesus as your Savior. You can get there because you live by the golden rule and the Ten Commandments. You're so good. That makes Jesus' prayer uh, a mockery when he said Lord if there's any other way this cup of death can pass from me this cross can pass from me let it be there is no other way no one none's righteous no not one all of us have sinned number two lie is the opposite of the first it's not you're so good you don't need a savior it's so bad he can't save you there's nothing you've done that he is not willing and able to forgive you of no matter how many times you may have fallen he said, how many times should we forgive someone? Seven times? And no, 70 times seven. Number three lie, this is not the time. Put it off. My friend Joel was under that lie. Put it off till you're 30. Sow your wild oats. I believe if God's knocking, you can't get saved unless he's knocking. He's drawing, he's knocking. Then it is the day and it is the time of your salvation. Come now. Six. Five, take that first step. Four, in the New Testament, more people are saved as family groups than they are as individuals. I was in Kuala Lumpur and I saw a whole tribe come out, this big Methodist church, a whole tribe came together. You may have been here with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your friend, and you, you want to come, but you don't know what they want to do. Squeeze their hand. Everybody, if you just touch hands to the person you came with, you say, I want to do this, but you're afraid. You're not doing it because you're afraid of what the other ones want to do. Squeeze their hand. Saying, I want to come. And the other one says, me too. Squeeze and then come together. We only have a few seconds left. Three. Two. Come to Jesus. 
one if you're coming to give your life to him come right here zero Pastor Glenn I'm going to turn the service over to you there's some people that's come that wants to accept Jesus and a lot of other needs here